So welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today. Um, so just a few uh, housekeeping items before we get going. So the first off, I'll introduce myself. For those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Cheryl Ehrman and I'm the Don Beal Dean of the Charles Davidson College of Engineering. And uh, this is our Silicon Valley Leaders Symposium. Uh, in these uh, new times, we're grateful that we've had the ability to take this uh, to a virtual experience. And again, thank you for joining us. It looks like we have something like 90 or more participants so far, that's great. Uh, so for housekeeping, um, we do have our speakers today and they will welcome your questions at any point, um, either during or after uh, their more formal presentation. So please use the Q&A button, which is down at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit questions. Uh, and you can also raise your hand and then um, we'll recognize you and, and then you could speak your question. Uh, we also have a chat box. And so if you wanna use the chat to uh, chat um, amongst yourselves, that's fine too, but don't put your questions in the chat box. Please use the Q&A button or raise your hand. So um, I, I'd like to, to uh, introduce our speakers. So um, Elizabeth Kuka is uh, our, 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 one of our speakers and I will give a, an introduction to Zane in a minute. Um, so uh, Liz is the executive director of Ethereum Classic Labs, and she's streaming her, or streaming her talk about blockchain for us, and we're grateful for her willingness to adapt the presentation, and we're also honored to have her and Zane um, share your knowledge today. So Liz is local. She graduated from San Jose's own Archbishop Mitty High School. Uh, she went to uh, San Francisco State University, receiving a bachelor's degree in environmental science, and then also a teaching credential from uh, CSU Monterey Bay. She was a teacher for seven years in San Francisco Unified before getting her MBA from the California College of the Arts in San Francisco in 2016. And then starting in 2016, she would, was a design strategist for Cisco and Hive Lab. And then uh, after that, she worked um, from 2017 to 2018 out of the startup accelerator Plug and Play, uh, the Plug and Play Tech Center, where she was head, and then she was head of programs and operations for Insertech and Enterprise. And then in 2018, she became program director and now executive director of Ethereum Classic Labs, which is an incubator that accelerates innovations on the Ethereum Classic blockchain, ETC. Uh, and then also as of 2019, she's also a principal in the Digital Finance Group USA, which is a venture capital company. And she will be joined today by Zane Starr. And uh, so I'm just gonna give a little bit about Zane that I got really quickly off your LinkedIn. So, um, so Zane is a software engineer at Ethereum Classic Labs, and we're super excited to have him here. I hear that there might be demonstrations. Uh, and he received his Bachelor of Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. So welcome both, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, we asked Zane to join this presentation maybe two weeks ago, and so uh, I want to apologize for not having a, a better introduction for, for Zane, but I'm sure he'll be able to, to introduce himself just fine. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I do have a little bit of an overview of my background, but I think Cheryl just covered it really, really well. So I might just skip that page. Um, again, I'm, I'm Liz Kuka, Executive Director at Ethereum Classic Labs. We're based in downtown San Francisco. And for the presentation today, I'm gonna cover items one through three on that agenda, and then Zane will do four through six. So we're gonna start with the origins of blockchain, uh, crypto and the security of it, Ethereum Classic and Ethereum Classic Labs. And so items one and two is really just to level set for everyone in the room. Some of you may be really advanced in blockchain and crypto. Some of you might be beginners. Some of you may have never heard much about it. So the intent is to really get everybody on the same page. And then to talk about the history of ETC, the lab, and then Zane will go over what the core dev team is doing, our university initiative, and then um, conclude with tokenomics. And um, we'll also share a, kind of a demo, or a demo about a simulation project. Okay, so there we are. Uh, we already went over everything about my background and I'm from San Jose originally, so go San Jose folks. And uh, origins of blockchain. So to kick this off, I wanted to start by talking about Bitcoin. Um, right in front of you what, you, what you're looking at is the Satoshi white paper, which came out in 2009. And Although this came out in 2009, it was actually in the early 90s that there was an, an effort and an initiative for, for users to really maintain a network and an effort to decrease spam and, and to do other, other things like that. 
And so this concept, this peer-to-peer -peer kind of proof of work concept, um, it didn't start with Bitcoin, it's been around for a while, um, but, I, but Bitcoin is really what helped it take off. Um, this is a pretty short paper. It's around nine pages long and really seven if you don't include the, the resources at the end and the equations. And, and the gist of the paper uh, is really, is really these, these four points. The idea is to have a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, market or economy. Um, it's decentralized, it's powered by its users, and it's cryptographically secure. So if you decide that you don't want to read the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, um, here's kind of a quick overview. But again, it's a, a pretty simple read. And, and I think it's an important one to read because it gets to the, to the core of the values of, of where blockchain started. It doesn't mean that's where it is today, and it doesn't mean that that's where it's going to go, but at least you'll get a sense of like re really where it started. And so since Bitcoin, um, there's been a ton of other coins and other chains that have kind of come to the surface since then. And the reason why is because they have different rules or they follow different like value sets. Um, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic is the original Ethereum. Uh, you know, the big difference between Bitcoin and, and Ethereum is that there's smart contracts involved. And so it's the ability to have not only programmable money, but to have agreements between people and um, beyond just monetary exchange. And so what is crypto and how is it secure? I'm going to read a couple of these to you just to make sure we're all kind of saying and thinking the same thing. Um, it's designed to work as a medium of exchange that uses uh, cryptography to secure financial transactions uh, and control the creation of additional units and verify the transfer of assets. So it's kind of a bit, and I also mentioned cryptography, which some of you might be familiar with, some of you might not be familiar with. Um, so cryptography, it, it's an algorithm, right? It's an algorithm and secret keys that encrypt and decrypt data. And so that's really where the word you know, crypto, um, that's where it comes from, it's, it's from cryptography. So it's used to provide secrecy and integrity to our data and both authentication and anonymity to our communications. And so that's the premise, right, of, of, of crypto. And um, here's a really quick, simple flow of, of how cryptography works at its most simplest uh, form. And I'm happy to share this presentation after or feel free to take uh, screenshots of, of anything. Now, I really wanted to have this be as interactive as possible. Um, I'm curious if anyone in the room has crypto aside from Zane. <laughs> um, and so if you, if you do hold any crypto, uh, feel free to use the, the raise hand feature because I'm, I'm pretty curious. And, and if you don't, uh, this is a, probably a place that you might get started. Uh, Coinbase is a really simple tool to use and this is what it looks like. Where you see that trade button on the far right, that's where you're going to essentially buy and sell. And um, this is an older screenshot that I took because Bitcoin's now at 7,000 today. So I think this is from last month. So if you had bought last month, um, it's increased um, by quite a bit since then. Coinbase is not the only place to buy and sell crypto. Uh, this is Binance, which is a bit more technical. So this is probably a, a better step for someone who's more comfortable and is, and is really looking at highs and lows within a short period of time. And if you're really financial <laughs> and, you're, and you're comfortable with traditional markets and with using strategies like candlestick, where it's like these little tabs, like these, these green and pink, larger carrot looking things, and when you're really looking at market data and, and you're using strategies to buy and sell. And so this is very technical. I, I use the first one. I use the really simple, easy one <laughs> because I, I just don't, this is not one of my passion areas, um, buying and selling like in, in, in micro minutes and or in seconds and, and, and doing this constantly day in and day out, but, but it's an option. Okay, and so what happens after you buy crypto? Well, there's a number of ways that, that you can store it. And to begin, let's go over what the word self-custody means. So self-custody, if you think of the word custody, like custody of a child, it's, it's ownership, right, or responsibility for. Um, and so in, with self-custody, you're, you're taking the responsibility to manage your crypto. And in crypto, remember we talked about cryptography, you have um, a, some what are called private keys. And these private keys are a long string of data. And uh, you have private keys that are then turned into like phrases. So you can have, say, I think it's like 16 phrases, keywords that you use to unlock your crypto. Um, 
And one way you can do this is with Ledger on the far, on my far left, like a hardware device. And on the far, on the right is Button Wallet. Uh, Button Wallet is an app that's embedded in Telegram and they don't store your keys anywhere. And so even though you can buy and sell and send crypto with Button Wallet, they don't store your keys. And so you're still providing that self custody yourself. You're, you're responsible for your crypto because you're maintaining your keys. Now, not everybody wants to have that kind of responsibility. Self custody really is the goal, I, I think, or was the vision for, for blockchain and crypto because it's peer to peer. It's, it's getting rid of that middle person. It's getting rid of the centralization of, of one authority or one corporation or one group controlling things. And so this is kind of like the ideal for, for or like the mission. But for people like myself who, who lose things, it's not always the best option. It's kind of like my goal is to get to self custody, uh, but I'm not there yet. And so here's a quick flow of, again, how it works. And then for somebody like myself who, who, who wants somebody to, <laughs> to, to watch and hold their money for them, because I, if you've lost your, your laptop, your bag, your purse, your wallet, your, your keys to your car, or your home, if you're somebody who's ever lost anything like that, um, maybe you want someone else to, to manage it for you. And so this is what it would look like, um, looking at the far right image first. This is my Coinbase wallet, one of my Coinbase wallets. And so what happens is if I were to, if I were to send somebody on this call $5, it would come from uh, Coinbase is holding onto my keys to release those funds. And so I'm relying on that, that third party. On the left side, this is an image um, to represent more, um, uh, like, uh, sorry, it's, it, it represents uh, institutional custody. And so when an institution provides custody, what I mean by that is it's for larger amounts of money, say $50,000, $100,000, millions of dollars. That's when the image on the left, that's what it's representing, is, is institutional custody. And so somebody like Bank of America, Visa, MasterCard, um, somebody who's just a high net worth individual, they would probably not want to hold on to $100,000 or millions of dollars they want someone else to do it for them because it's a lot of money. And in the case of MasterCard, Visa, and Bank of America, they don't want to touch crypto at all from, a rely from, a, from a, an accountability perspective and from a regulatory perspective, they don't want to be involved. So they might offer the services. They might want to help their customers with, with features and functions and, and products that are crypto related, but they won't actually hold the crypto. And so an institutional provider will hold the crypto. Um, okay, and so that's custody, self-custody and custody, and that's how crypto is kind of stored or held. And, and who accepts crypto? Um, I think just two years ago or three years ago, people always kind of, people were like, where can I even spend this? What do I do with this, with this digital currency? Well, every single store on this image in front of, in front of you, uh, I think I've shopped at all of them at one point, but if you're not staring at the screen, uh, it's GameStop and Crate and Barrel and Whole Foods. So pretty much all of the major retailers now accept cryptocurrency. Um, they do this through an app called Flexa. And in addition to Flexa, uh, Square, like the little Square device, uh, will take crypto payments very soon. Uh, I don't think it's live just yet. I believe it's still in, uh, in its test phase. For a lot of folks getting into crypto, um, you know, a big question is security. Uh, how do I know that this is, this is safe and secure? And in the Ethereum Classic world, we follow the, the proof of work consensus. Um, and so what that does is it converts energy into hashing power. And the more hashing power a network has, the more secure it is. And the more miners who are the ones that are validating the network, um, they're running, they're, when they're all running the same algorithm, it's keeping the network more decentralized and more secure because there's more hash power. And another aspect of security is that when there's multiple um, folks contributing to the network and maintaining the network, it's not centralized. And so there's not a single point of failure, right? It's, it's, it's um, a distributed system. And so it's far more difficult to, to hack into a distributed system or can be. All right, so we talked about Bitcoin a little bit, talked a little bit about crypto talked a little bit about securing the network. And so what in the world does Ethereum Classic um, have to do with all of this and, and how is it different? So Ethereum Classic is the original Ethereum. 
Uh, it started out first as a concept in 2013 by Vitalik Buterin, Gavin Wood, uh, Charles Hoskinson, and, and another contributor whose name uh, slips my mind. And it was in 2015 that it actually launched and, and went live. It's a, a proof of work a consensus, as just mentioned. And some of the major beliefs are censorship resistance, immutability, and decentralization. Uh, immutability means that there's a record in history and you, and you can't delete that, you can't delete any record within, within the history ledger. So it doesn't mean that you can't make changes. It doesn't mean that you can't say, um, I'm gonna sell you this bicycle for $100 and tomorrow I say, actually it's, the price has gone up, there's greater demand, it's now $110. It doesn't mean that you can't make changes. It means that you just can't delete the history that the bike was ever for sale in the first place. And so that's the idea of immutability, that the, that the record is, is permanent. Um, and then what happened is in 2016, there was a, the DAO hack. And what happened is there was a big group on the Ethereum network who wanted to give money back uh, to the people who, to the investors for the Ethereum token sale. And so the idea was that uh, they wanted to do an irregular state change. They wanted to, to make it as if the, the DAO never, that this uh, instance never existed, it never happened. So you had, part of the network that wanted to do an irregular state change, which is kind of like a no-no. And then you had another part of the network that said, no, this is not, immu this is not immutability. This is not code is law. This is not anything that, that we stand for as a community and as an ecosystem. So there was a hard fork. And a part of that group um, trademarked the name Ethereum right away, right after this hard fork happened. And that group is the group that wanted to do the irregular state change, give the money back to the investors. The other group thought that that was like bailing out the bankers. And that group became known as Ethereum Classic. And so that's kind of the origin story. Ethereum Classic really follows the, the original values and beliefs of Ethereum. Um, and unfortunately had to, or fortunately, had to change its name uh, because of the trademark. So some other things to know about Ethereum Classic, or also known as ETC, um, is that the gas to run the network, it's, it's relatively cheap. It's not free, but it is cheap. It lacks network bloat. We have a solid dev team and you'll meet Zane in just a little bit. We have community resources, which means funding, dev support, and we host conferences and events and, and we're decentralized. And we're decentralized because Ethereum Classic Labs were not the only um, contributor to the network. And we're not the only ones running nodes on the network. So a little bit more about ETC. Uh, this was a screenshot from yesterday. It's currently at $5.38, and it's uh, ranked 21 out of around 200 on coin market cap. So if you're curious, kind of like in the rankings, where does ETC sit? We're generally between 21 and 15. Um, it fluctuates quite a bit. We're listed on just about every major exchange. And it's a network that's maintained by, by many groups. Ethereum Classic Labs uh, were one of those groups. ETC Co-op is another one, completely separate organization, completely separate funding, completely different people. IOHK Cardano, it's a separate blockchain that also supports Ethereum Classic. Grayscale, which is not on here, um, they're an investment firm, they support it, as well as 450 independent contributors and probably more um, who, who are contributing. These different contributors also vote on, on changes to the network. Um, and so that's important and, and Zane can probably talk about that a little bit more later. All right, so we covered the basics of blockchain and crypto. We covered Ethereum Classic. And so who in the world am I and Zane and, and what's our team doing uh, every day? So we're, we're an investor and an accelerator. We're a core development team for Ethereum Classic. And we also um, are involved in research and development and provide grants for, for R&D. We work with 10 to 20 startups per year on the accelerator side. We've recently changed our funding model from investment to grants. And those are generally 25,000 to $100,000 per grant. We're a global program that's also virtual. So you don't have to come into our office in San Francisco. However, we do have desk space available if you, if you wanna stop by or if you're in our program. And we make investor introductions and we help with fundraising. We provide marketing and PR. 
And then our dev team is there as a resource. Um, they'll help teams migrate to ETC, integrate on ETC. They don't build for any of the teams, but, but they just they help um, getting to know the ETC tools and uh, the blockchain itself, the ETC blockchain. And then we have an alumni program. So when a team is done working with us for, say, a month, three months, six months, because each project varies, um, we're still there. So we still bring teams in for, for events or make introductions and, and try to be helpful. If something like this is of interest to anybody on the call, this is pretty much how the application process works. It's a rolling basis. So applications are kind of always accepted and it's around a month, month and a half process. So you, you apply online, we do a phone interview, we review your, your pitch deck, your website, your white paper, if you have one, um, your technical documents. And then we do further diligence by checking out the tech itself, like testing out your website, say, um, talking to users or customers and just doing traditional diligence. And um, a team will then send us a proposal. So the proposal can be for two weeks, can be for a month long project, six month project, it's really up to the team. They scope the work and then they also um, make a request for how much, um, like what type of grant size they would like. And then if everything works out, then they join Ethereum Classic Labs. The areas that we're currently uh, providing funding for are for devs for devs or also known as infrastructure and tooling or tools that developers, blockchain developers will use. Uh, financial inclusion. This also includes decentralized finance, also known as DeFi, and impact in emerging markets. We're not doing as, we haven't really looked at too much um, of impact for, for the US or for, for Europe. It's, it's mostly just for emerging markets. Quick overview of some of the teams that we've worked with. Our very first cohort last year um, did not follow those three buckets I just mentioned. This is supply chain, gov tech, media, edge computing. I, it was really kind of a, a test run. And then our second cohort last year, we, we merged over to financial inclusion, dev tooling, and um, impact in emerging markets. So these are some of the teams that we've worked with. Cohort three. So for cohort three, this is where we've done that rolling application model. And so we have three teams that are starting with us within the next two weeks. And then in about a month and a half, we'd bring on another two to three teams and another month and a half, so on and so forth. So those teams aren't really in interacting with each other so much as we're trying to build out this ecosystem where they can contact each other if needed or get discounts or free services from those other members within the ecosystem. So cohort three, it's about to launch. Here's the first team. You guys are the first ones to hear about this. We haven't even announced this public, publicly yet. So actually you can't, don't share this part. Don't share the next three slides because um, we're not gonna announce it for a few weeks. So PingMe, PingMe falls into the financial inclusion category and they provide micro loans to different countries within Africa. Rivet, they are a node infrastructure provider. So they fall into that, that dev tooling and, and infrastructure bucket. And then Prescripto. Prescripto um, is digitizing prescriptions and starting, um, starting in Mexico where they're based. And they're also making um, the process of moving from say uh, clinic to clinic um, to receive prescriptions easier for, for care providers and for customers alike. And they fall into our um, impact and emerging markets category. I mentioned earlier, we also do research and development or provide grant funding for, for R&D. These are the three buckets in the R&D space, uh, decentralized storage, scalability, and interoperability. And I'm going to quickly share two teams that we've worked with from the R&D side, just to, get a, just to give everybody a sense. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Zane. So Swarm, this is a decentralized storage team who we've just recently started working with. They're also doing what's known as a token sale. So we'll actually provide um, a grant and possibly invest as well. And this is my, my favorite one only because there's not a website. And, and this to me makes it look very much like this is an R&D project. This is not a startup. This is not an accelerator project. This is very much a very technical team. Uh, this is Ledger Watch and Ledger Watch is working on stateless channels. And so they go into the, the scalability, the blockchain scalability bucket for, for R&D. Um, and with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions now or later. Um, on my screen, I can't see the chat raise hand. I can't see anything uh, other than my screen. So 
uh, feel free to send me questions on, on Twitter, on Telegram, to my email, or again, just uh, ask away. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to pass the, the mic to Zane. Okay. Hey, so how's it going? I think we have a few questions from the last presentation. So if you look at the Q&A, um, there's a couple for you, I think, and a couple that maybe I can answer, uh, or we can both answer. Uh, one second. There we go. All right. What are some of the most popular companies that offer institutional custody? Yeah, uh, BitGo. BitGo is a really big one. Another one's Anchorage. Uh, third one is Spanoa. So BitGo is based in San Francisco. Anchorage is, I think they're in Europe, I want to say. I think they're in London. Spanoa is in Germany. And Digital Finance Group should have a custody solution by the end of this year. Great question. What else? Uh, do you have data business analytic opportunities? I'm, re I'm reading from the chat, by the way. Um, what's Liz, sorry. If you click on the Q and A button, it will yeah. the the list of questions. Oh, wonderful. Okay. What is the worst that can happen while using cryptocurrencies? Um, what's the worst that can happen? I guess the worst that could happen is you could accidentally send somebody money and send it to the wrong address and they don't receive it. <laughs> you can lose your keys if you're trying to solve custody and then you lose your money. Um, but it's kind of just like cash. Like if you misplace where you put your cash, you misplaced it and you can't find it, right? So it's, it's kind of similar. Zane, what do you think? What's the worst thing that can happen? Losing your private keys. <laughs> <laughs> if you use those, there's no, there's no hope for you. <laughs> yeah. It's done, it's the end game. Yeah. Okay. But people are working on solutions to, um, to have more redundancy in that and more reliability. So um, some people are doing things like smart contract wallets, um, which they kind of use social proof and other things and like uh, identity providers are kind of becoming a thing um, to like sort of escalate like your money and so you can have some sense of recovery, um, like a credit card or something like that. Yeah, Zane, do you want to take the next question on data business and oh, internship opportunities? Um, yes, we do. So the I, I don't want to I don't want to miss say your name. I, I believe it's is it Anjika? Um, Anjika, I'm probably miss saying your name, but yes, we do have internship opportunities. Um, feel free to reach out and and send over whatever materials you you have. Uh, opinion on Bitcoin having the having. Yeah, uh, so what happens for everyone on the call about the Bitcoin halvening and Ethereum Classic as well and any other like mine, mineable chain is that the, the block reward will reduce and, and it's okay. I mean, ideally the, the price of Bitcoin or Ethereum Classic will, will go up and therefore the reward will, will still be you know, pretty good. Um, I don't know, Zane, do you have any, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, so it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so like the happening for, for people who don't know is basically uh, it changes the inflation rate. So um, there's a schedule <laughs> as to like all the rewards that like you issue like cryptocurrency. Uh, and so uh, I forgot the actual schedule. It's like a fiffening actually versus like a happening. So uh, for ETC anyways. And so the block reward rate is reduced uh, as it uh, approaches like zero over time. So by like 2050, uh, there will be no more block rewards. And um, what that means is that the work that miners do to do like proof of work, uh, the incentives will go to zero. And the only way that they'll make money is off of the transaction fees uh, that users pay uh, to get or induce miners to include their transactions in the next block. And so what that does is it means that the currency is deflationary. There's like a fixed cap supply of how much they'll ever be on the market. And so, um, yeah, it has that deflationary pressure. Whereas like say Ethereum doesn't um, 
Bitcoin also has this deflationary um, pressure, which is like the happening and things like that. So I like it, but I don't know where that's going. <laughs> I mean, ideally, ideally, there'll be a large enough network, right? Like network effects that the network will take care of this, will take care of itself, like a big enough community that it should be fine. Yeah. It's 30, it's 30 I, I years I, from now. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's a problem, but it, like it, for me, it, it's an unknown. It's a monetary policy that we think is going to have like a positive effect. Um, I mean, increase in value of currency, who doesn't like that? <laughs> and uh, reliance on like a deterministic future, that's also like more security, uh, more value that you can like sort of anticipate less risk. Uh, so in theory, more stability. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Zane, this one's for you. Which one is better, Ethereum or Ethereum Classic? I like Ethereum Classic because like it's an inflationary currency. I work on it, so I'm partial. <laughs> but I used to work on Ethereum as well. Uh, and like I kind of view it as one Ethereum altogether, so it's one big melting pot. But I like Ethereum Classic for its community, so cool. I, I like Ethereum too. <laughs> I'm not too partial. <laughs> but just a little partial towards ETC. All right, from Deepa, what are some of the prerequisites to apply for a position? Um, for internship, it's, you know, we don't expect you to have five years of experience. <laughs> you know, we, we, we realize you're a student, um, but if you're talking about applying for, for a full-time position or even part-time position, it depends. So if it's uh, development related, you wanna, you're a computer science student, um, I would I would defer to Zane. I know it's a, a really high learning curve to get into smart contract development. Like you already have to know how to build software, right? And then from there, you're also taking on the blockchain piece. So I think it's it's a bit tricky, but but certainly not impossible. Yep, I think it just kind of depends on what um, slice of the stack that you're looking to do. So if you're more into like taking distributed systems courses and building infrastructure and things like that. There's plenty of opportunities for junior devs to like sort of jump in and like start learning that craft. Uh, a lot of the tasks that you end up doing are going to be uh, traditional software development tasks. Um, and then there's like a minor part of that that's blockchain. Uh, for the other aspects of that, um, there's economics research. So if you're studying math, and data science that's still kind of decoupled from like the cryptocurrency aspect. Uh, and like, there's just like a lot to sort of do it. And then if you're like sort of a full stack dev, that's more of uh, a little bit of the front end, a little bit, et cetera, and you want to be a DAP developer, the uh, bar is kind of high at the moment because um, the tooling is at the point where you need to know the infrastructure piece, you need to know sort of the front end piece, you need to know the economics piece. You, you pretty much have to know everything. And so the bar is basically, uh, you're good at traditional like web development. You're already familiar with all those tools. You're good at doing the DevOps side of that. Uh, and then you're capable of like sort of figuring out the research aspects of that. Yeah. Great. Um, from Sojanya. Uh, what are the most exciting reasons to become involved with digital currencies? I would think that my answers might be different than Zane's, not really sure. My interest is on new business models and new ways that, like democratizing business ownership. It's kind of, I kind of think of blockchain as, as like the ability to have co-ops, sort, sort of like that, where everyone's kind of getting a piece of the pie and everyone's contributing. So I, I think that's the most fascinating part for, for me. It's probably far from a reality, but it's a new way to, to structure businesses. It could be a new way to structure governments. It can be a new way to, to really structure anything. Um, I think that's what's most exciting. The digital currency piece you see in places like Venezuela, um, Argentina as well, where Bitcoin's taken off really, really well when the value of their dollar, um, when, when inflation's so high that it becomes almost worthless. And so it's a, it's a store of value. And so for some, for some different parts of the world, it's it's been highly impactful. Actually, like I'm pretty much excited about the same things Liz is. Um, just that the uh, the fact that you can sort of build this your own sort of economy or structure your own sort of economic games um, uh, that are crafted to like sort of hyper localization, um, which is just like 
right there in your community is really like sort of exciting. You don't have to have this top down structure. And so you can kind of build things from a bottom up perspective. All right, from Ruben Flores, do you think major banks will ever change their perspective on digital currency? Zane? Oh, yeah, I think that they will. I think, um, I think a lot of uh, banks are kind of interested in this and like uh, shifting towards digital currency because the impact is so large. Um, I know that like, companies like Ripple uh, that kind of run a private blockchain like network between the people that they like accept into this consortium of networks are already using this kind of technology to reduce costs um, and to like really do like highly liquid transactions or cross currency exchanges. Um, so banks are definitely interested and a lot of large banks are already on like networks like this. Um, no, the question is whether or not they do public blockchains and like I think they're probably less inclined to do that kind of a thing. Um, but uh, the blockchain technology is already just opening doors. Okay, uh, Giorgio, I'm still confused on how cryptocurrencies value fluctuation, where it comes from, um, how they increase and decrease over time. Can you elaborate? Um, so great question. It's not that different, in my opinion, from traditional markets. You could argue, well, you know, Nike, Nike's gone up in price because, I don't know, their new shoes that are coming out are, are highly valued and um, the board members are, are happy and you're, and you're getting all this news so you know it's time to buy, right? Like you're reading the reports and so you're making an informed decision on, on whether to buy or sell. Um, it's, it's not entirely different in the crypto space. You, you'll read what's happening in, in Ethereum or Ethereum Classic or Bitcoin um, and, you, and you're kind of guessing, you're constantly guessing. I mean, it's no different than the traditional stock market in my opinion, that you're just having to, to engage and, and know what's going on in that, in that ecosystem to have a good sense of when it's a good time to buy or sell. Zane? Yeah, sure. Yeah, the, I, they work just like regular markets, I think. Um, in a certain way, they're a little bit more closed form, but they are becoming more complicated. So uh, I view them as like slightly more narrow scopes or views on um, traditional uh, economic markets. Okay, I'm going to speed through these so we don't cut into your time because I know your yeah, presentation is yeah. going to take a little bit. I'll be brief too. Okay. All right. Uh, does ETC from Ahmed, does ETC plan on joining in game markets such as Mortal Kombat microtransactions? Um, that's cool. I don't think we are. Oftentimes gaming, it requires a lot of data, a lot of data storage space needs to have speed. Um, it just, it, it's a tricky one. And there are some chains that are specific to gaming um, and that are really interested in gaming. We, we haven't done much so far. Yeah. I would say the closest thing that we are kind of looking into are ways to uh, like sort of scale uh, blockchain state. And those would be like sort of those optimistic roll up pro uh, projects. Um, but those are mostly outside of the team uh, development and more like sort of investments, that kind of thing. Okay, next question from Manjesh. Um, I have read people using crypto for unethical ways like trading on dark web. Can you please address on that? Well, absolutely. It seems so silly to me that anyone would use crypto to do something illegal because it's traceable versus using cash or fiat currency where you could hand somebody a suitcase full of dollars that no one can ever trace. So I think it's really wild for people to use crypto to do illegal activity. Now there are some chains that are privacy and um, anonymity like specific. Um, I don't want, I'm not gonna name them because I don't wanna, I don't wanna like trash any other chains, but Ethereum Classic is, is not one of those. So it's, it's all traceable if, if needed. Yeah, it, it's it's always a murky world when you're into like the sort of dark web kind of things. Uh, like so, like if people, <laughs> the authorities definitely watch transactions and like traditional like crime. So uh, this uh, woman in Florida was like uh, caught like sort of washing money, uh, which means like, hey, give me $5,000 in cash and I'll slide you this much BTC. <laughs> and so the authorities warned her, hey, uh, you can't like be this kind of uh, money provider. So that's why there are things like KYC. Uh, and so they like arrested her. And so now she's on trial. Uh, so yeah, authorities are, are still watching and generally they look at the vectors or the entryways uh, through traditional crime, rather. 
Yeah, and what Jazane said on KYC AML, it's it's know your customer anti money laundering, and so you'll hear that a lot in the space uh, KYC AML, and and it's something that everyone in the space pretty much abides by. Um, okay. This is Audrey. I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, do you have time before we move on to take a question from Young? Yeah, I, I believe so. so. Young, I'm going to unmute you and you can ask your question. So go ahead. I hope she's still there. Young, can you hear us? Okay, I don't think she's there anymore. All right, we're going to be moving on here. Okay, everybody, I'll answer the rest of the questions in type form so that um, Zane can start his presentation. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so uh, I am just going to get sort of set up and here we are. Cool. And I'll get sort of moving and grooving here in four seconds. Okay, so I am live. All right, so the sort of title of my talk today is Building a Decentralized Future. Um, let's build this thing together. Or I wanted to say, like, building the things to build the things to build the dreams. <laughs> As, like, a sort of different, like, take on this. Um, because it's really about, like, building an ecosystem. So who am I? My name is Zane Starr. Uh, I work with the core dev team, uh, pr principally on tooling. Uh, prior to that, I used to work on everything from uh, wireless sensor networks to big data at Groupon to various startups and primarily focused on building services and things like that. Uh, before joining ETC Labs, I was at Consensus where I worked on decentralized um, science fiction. Okay, so Liz already asked this question, but I wanted to kick it off uh, with this question too, which is sort of uh, how many of us actually use crypto for anything? Uh, and then on top of that, how many of us use it for anything other than just uh, financial instruments? So like speculation. And so like we have to sort of think about like why is that and why is DeFi sort of the major like sort of player in this space? And I think that has to do with uh, having not found the like sort of perfect fit um, between tying together all of the entities that are trying to participate uh, in blockchain. So one of those kind of challenges and one of the things to sort of propose is what is happening is that there's this opacity. So developers want to talk to technology and they want to connect with users, but there's this like sort of opaque wall that's just kind of blocks that connection. So developers don't know exactly how to interface with the technology and technology is not really communicating backwards on how to connect with it in this sort of effective way. And users, they wanted to connect to blockchain for privacy, for data sovereignty, for all of these great features. And they are connecting with it in the way that they know how or the way that they can see. Uh, but then they don't know how to connect with the applications that um, developers are building um, because there's also still this layer of opacity. So uh, it's kind of like the wild, wild west still. So the early 90s of uh, the internet in which there are lots of different kind of variations on supported HTML, et cetera. And so those tools really aren't there. An example would be uh, that you're a user and you own some Dogecoin which is the coin with the uh, dog. <laughs> and you want to uh, play some sort of video game or you want to interact with a social media service uh, or consume some content. And the requirement is that you connect uh, to Ethereum Classic. And the question for you is, is that you've spent all this time researching Doge, you love, you love Doge, uh, and like all of the things that you know how to do are with Doge. The developer wants to connect with you because they know that you want to connect with the service that uh, is on, say, Ethereum Classic. But they don't know what you're running, how you're doing it, or what crypto you're using. So they, they literally just don't have the tools required to interface with you. Uh, and you don't have the knowledge, per se, to uh, spin up another blockchain client uh, and connect with the developer in their specific way. So blockchain technology is just way too opaque. 
Uh, the other sort of problems that we're facing in this space is that there is no gateway application for blockchain. So uh, in the early 90s, what we were doing is we were just kind of like, uh, well, rather in the late 90s, um, we were just like sort of playing with these ideas of connecting to the internet and what it could be used for. So there were forums and bulletin boards, but there really wasn't a way uh, to like bridge the gap between the physical world and the virtual world. And these kind of bridging applications, I think are really indicative of when a technology has like sort of widespread impact. So there's really no PayPal's, there's no Ebay's um, that bring a new class of services to take the thing that's going at hyperspeed on uh, in the virtual world into the physical world. So what we're looking for is ways to engage people to build the future uh, that we all kind of want. And so the, the question is what's needed at its core to make it possible for us to build interesting things. Uh, not just interesting things, but um, to build the technology to build the technology. And so uh, what is the technology that we want? We want things that uh, promote openness. So most of blockchain technology is open source. Uh, we want things that are pro-privacy. So we don't want to necessarily be tracking with you to have uh, agency and this concept of data so sovereignty, which means that you like own your data. Uh, and we want things to be like transparent. So if I'm interacting with a business, I can trust that the business is doing this thing uh, because there is openness about what the business is actually doing and how it operates. And we want things to be fast. Uh, we live in 2020. We really don't want to go to the speed of dial-up. And so like, we want to sort of improve this like, speed of the networks. Okay, so what are we doing to really solve these problems? And so earlier I, I talked about the opacity and like how there's this layer of like opaqueness, um, these uh, blurred glass walls between everything. So you can kind of see where you're going, but you can't quite reach there. And so one of those problems are uh, just meeting developers where they're at and getting uh, developers the tools to build the right things. So blockchain programming languages are somewhat unfamiliar. And so let's take a look at this diagram. So on the left, we have sort of a fictional language that no one really knows what it means. It's just made up, it's not even like real but it kind of has a format that looks like a, like a real language. So we see something that kind of looks like punctuation. Uh, it seems like there's some phrasing, there's spaces. So maybe these are words, maybe these are alphabets, maybe these are letters. Uh, and like we can kind of work out how to do it. And then uh, we can go forth and try and like write something in this new uh, unfamiliar language. And so really what it looks like today is that we're asking developers to take something like uh, the image on the left and translate it and put it onto all these different machines that make up the blockchain. Uh, and so the project that we are working on here at ETC Labs and the core dev team is a translation process called the EVM to LLVM. And so basically what it does is it allows programmers to write code in a familiar language and then to put that code on the blockchain. Uh, and that can be the language that you communicate or make or interact with uh, the blockchain. So at the bottom is an example of something that would be sort of translated. So it's an example of C uh, and then translating this language, which is super familiar and almost uh, millions of developers know how to write uh, and allowing uh, developers to use this language to write code for the blockchain. So the other sort of thing is uh, a layer of understanding. So in this diagram, uh, we have this man, he's trying to figure out like, well, wait a second here. Like the manual says I should be able to do this, but it doesn't quite fit. Uh, and it's just this layer of frustration. So this concept that we've been kind of playing with is this idea of programming what you can understand. And like, how do you make things understandable? And that really comes towards uh, documentation. Not only documentation for 
uh, people, but also for machines. So uh, what we've started to do is solve this problem of communication. So many blockchain projects use this protocol called JSON RPC. Uh, and it's actually more widely used than just blockchain. It's used in regular development. Uh, and the problem with JSON RPC is that there aren't the same sort of tools that you would get in traditional web development that allow you to communicate what your programming software interface does, uh, as well as uh, allow you to sort of test this uh, in a way that is tightly coupled with the functionality of the software. So what we've done is we started this project called OpenRPC, which is a JSON RPC document description language. And that's a mouthful, but the long and short of it is that it allows uh, developers to easily understand and discover what uh, blockchain software does. Not only does it allow developers to do this, it also allows for automation. So let's say that you uh, wanted to connect to a Bitcoin uh, app or a Bitcoin service. Um, you would simply write one of these documents and then the document from the description of what the API does uh, would generate code for any of the app developers to use. So for no work on the uh, developer side, uh, the uh, Bitcoin service provider can then uh, give developers the tools that they want to use and the language that they're familiar with to then write applications against. And so this like dramatically speeds up the process. And we have a lot of different projects um, that ETC Labs uh, is working on that uh, uses this same sort of paradigm. And so really, it's removing that other layer of opacity between developers and users, developers and the technology, technology and developers, and we're just unifying the language that we're speaking. Uh, and this goes a, a little bit further and some abstract or esoteric <laughs> sort of leanings. Uh, that talk about uh, being able to discover services uh, because you have this documentation and being able to write uh, code that is agnostic to the particular uh, blockchain that you're running. So it solves, it can help solve the Dogecoin uh, <laughs> issue. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've talked a lot about, um, we've talked a lot about the, the future um, but when we're really talking about the future, we're talking about um, everybody, and that includes universities. And universities tend to be hubs of innovation. Um, and so, like, if you think about where the internet emerged from and, like, certain networking protocols, uh, universities are kind of at, the, universities are at the center of that. So we're, it's really important that um, we make sure that universities aren't left out in this uh, ecosystem. But so I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, with universities. So one of the things that we're doing is trying to uh, be a part of larger initiatives that involve lots of different com uh, companies to really improve the standards and the, uh, infrastructure and support for educators to use uh, blockchain in their coursework. So part of that is we joined uh, earlier last year. Yeah, yeah, last year. We joined the Blockchain Education Alliance that uh, includes members such as Mousebout, uh, ourselves, Ripple, uh, Cosmos, uh, Tezos, uh, a lot of uh, different uh, sort of named uh, entities in blockchain across different blockchain platforms uh, that kind of banded together to try and figure out how we can engage student organizations. Um, uh, under sort of mouse belts, um, sort of leadership and organization, and provide courseware, conferences, and educational resources for uh, students. So, friends. <laughs> uh, this year, we've also done uh, a capstone project with Lehigh, which is wrapping up the first part of a two semester long project 
where we have weekly student-driven discussions with uh, students working on a capstone project uh, for their coursework. And it's over two semesters long, so they build uh, sort of the proof of concept MVP in semester one, and semester two, they try and build the, the real deal. So uh, the finished product and get users. And so this has uh, been really quite great for us internally as well as externally because it gets us a little bit more familiar with the challenges that new developers face uh, coming into the blockchain space. And it's been a really good high touch point there. I'm just gonna move forward. So this is a quote from Muhammad Ali uh, that's basically saying that I wish people would love, uh, love other people like they love me. So <laughs> um, what this means is uh, developers get a lot of love uh, in the blockchain space. Everyone talks about developers, but really it's people that are not developers that we need to engage more uh, in this whole blockchain development uh, ecosystem space. And so I want to talk a little bit about this proposal that we have for engaging people outside of just the development space. So um, before I dive into that, I wanna just give a little bit of background information. So uh, one of these things uh, that we've been talking about is token economics. So all token economics is, is just a way of talking about a digital currency which is in the form of a token, even technically Bitcoin is a token, uh, Ethereum is a token, and then those uh, tokens have tokens, so to speak. Um, so what is tokenomics? It's you, uh, an economy of some sort. So an economy could be anything, it could be like your simple smart contract, which we'll go through it, and some form of governance, which is like how are the rules set for this? And the governance could be automated, it could be all machine, or it could be like human intervention. So we'll just step through an example real quick. So uh, token economics 101. So we have you on the left, and let's say that you pay one uh, Ethereum classic uh, cryptocurrency to a smart contract. Uh, the rules of the smart contract are written that you issue these tokens called Zanes are called ZTKs. And so you pay one ETC and you get back 20 ZTKs. And that's simple. And this in itself is a token economy. So what if we expanded the, the possibilities of this token economy? So we have you that is also a part of a special group of people called members. And these members have the ability to vote on proposals to change the rate. And so uh, in this example, uh, you say that you wanna change the rate of issuance for ZTKs from 20 ZTKs for one ETC to 10 ZTKs for one ETC. So you propose this, the smart contract holds onto your proposal for some period of time. Uh, the people that are members of the group vote on it. And if the majority approves, then this proposal is ratified and you get a new rate. And so what does this look like? Now, after the proposal has been sort of ratified, you pay one ETC and you get 10 ZTKs. Someone else pays one ETC, they get 10 ZTKs. The rules of how the smart contract and the economy works has been just sort of ended and it's closed. So you, you have this idea of what is going to happen in this like, sort of economy. And this is like tokenomics. So what did we just do? So what we just did is, let's kind of mention this earlier about a DAO, is that we just created a DAO, more or less. It's a new type of organization called a decentralized autonomous organization. And so what are DAOs? DAOs are basically anything where there's a high degree of automation, the automated thing, uh, also holds capital. So no individual person holds it. The software sort of holds the money. Uh, and uh, humans are at the edge. Uh, and so this is a screen from sort of Wikipedia, um, but it's probably a, a great canonical like representation of this. I think this actually comes from a Vitalik talk. Um, so uh, humans are at the center of this and you have this capital. What is not a DAO? Uh, Things like web services are not a DAO. Uh, there's automation, but these uh, web services don't actually hold the money itself. 
the logic is, uh, or the rules of like who gets what, when, and where are all determined by sort of the software and people, um, but not in a way that's transparent or automated. Um, so like eBay is not a DAO, or PayPal is also not a DAO. Okay, so where do universities uh, come in? So universities, uh, we have this idea of a project to engage sort of a broader scope of people and get people interested and engaged in building the future shape of organizations. So this is an image of Farmville. And so the idea here is, is that what we could do is build uh, a simulation. And so imagine that you are running an organization uh, that is either a farm or a grocery store, and there is a market that uh, represents uh, the Central Valley in California um, agricultural food market. And you have to build a uh, decentralized organization that is capable of responding to events that occur within this simulation. And so the simulation actually mirrors the budget and the uh, utility functions of, of the real life ecosystem. And so you have this opportunity of figuring out what kind of governance structures, uh, what kind of voting proposals, and what kind of organizational um, behaviors uh, build an effective organization. And not just for organizations today, but for organizations in the future. So the shape, the way that you determine what you're going to sell, what you're going to buy, who gets to do that, what the corporate governance looks like, what the punishments are for doing something that's not allowed, how much free agency that you have in the organization, et cetera, uh, and whether or not you can sell shares in that organization or you sell uh, future expected cash flows. Um, you get to play with all of this and you get to sort of really explore what it means to, to work in uh, a future organization. And so what we're excited about and what we're interested in is working with universities to uh, help us discover what are new future uh, organizations. And it would be amazing to, to partner with uh, universities and sort of lift this uh, off the ground. And so um, just to recap, the, the DAO project uh, is to experiment with decentralized organizations uh, stress test future organizational governance structures and uh, to uh, provide people with exposure to the blockchain in a way that's more than just DeFi and uh, allows people that are outside of the development ecosphere to think about ways in which they structure these organizations. Um, and it should be easily accessible to everyone. And so what's backing this and like what's the technology that like builds on that? So I've been working on this project called uh, Toxin, which is a token economic simulator. It allows you to build economic models and agents that uh, generate uh, market behaviors. So uh, it uses a technique called agent-based modeling, which has been used to backfit and track uh, market bubbles and uh, crashes and uh, things such as the NASDAQ stock market. And agent-based modeling is used a lot in uh, economics to get sort of a sense for um, what is happening in like, economies. And so token economies make sense in this uh, context because they are a much narrower scope and scale than say the, like, the US market or, or things like that. And you can have this nice closed form. And so what you see here are people uh, playing this uh, economic game called a minority majority game in which uh, there are people that are contrarians and they try and go against the grain and there are people that like follow. So they try and uh, optimize for doing what the majority does. And so in this particular simulation, uh, when you have a high degree or a high amount of contrarians, uh, you see that there's a lot of price volatility. And so this shows sort of the price movements uh, along the market. And so uh, on this front, if you're a developer, you can sort of explore how 
your different token economic models uh, play and various makeups and mixtures of uh, populations and demographics. Uh, and you can sort of like stress test your market if you think it's uh, really going to be a uniform distribution of tokens that may buy you uh, access to the internet or access to food or things like that. Uh, then you can kind of see uh, what your model is doing under various uh, scenarios. Okay. So to recap, what is EZC Labs doing? Uh, we're trying to remove the uh, glass, <laughs> the blurred glass uh, that is blocking the connections and communications between users, developers, and the actual technology. And create access points for people to join uh, blockchain and to uh, partner with universities to help us develop a brighter and more interesting future um, and design the organizations in the future. So a lot, but we're really excited about building the tools to build the ecosystem. And here's some links for the end and I can share the presentation as well. Thank you. Uh, are there any sort of lingering questions here? I think uh, there are two. Well, technically one. Monesty already asked most of her questions, um, and this is Audrey again. So Liz did a great job answering most of the questions. She, there's one if you would like to just kind of wrap it up here. Yeah, sure. Because I know her over time. Uh, so, will the role of traditional financial systems decline due to the development of cryptocurrencies? Um, I think that the roles of the traditional finance system will just move to using cryptocurrency. So I think they'll more or less evolve, and I think you can see this happening already. Um, so a lot of companies will contract company consultancies like Ernst & Young or Consensus uh, to help them start investigating how they can use blockchain or whether or not they like do any sort of issuance and things like that. So I, th I think it's just going to uh, like sort of evolve with the times. How the rare Pepe cryptocurrency works. You know what that is, Zane? No. I looked it up. <laughs> what is it? It's not like that green frog meme. Oh, you know yeah, the green frog meme, but I have no clue. Yeah. What people um, are doing. Garland, I looked it up really quick. <laughs> um, it looks kind of like a crypto kitties kind of thing. Like people are paying a lot of money to get these pictures of like the green frog. Otherwise, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> All I have fun. to say is this. <laughs> Internet, why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, cryptocurrency end up supplanting all national currencies. Actually, I don't think that's 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 necessarily going to happen. I was on the call yesterday where um, people were actually talking about central banks issuing digital currencies, um, or CBDCs as they're called, and that's kind of an interesting idea. You can imagine the Federal Reserve issues the digital currency. Maybe it makes them a little bit more compatible, or it makes it easier at least to bridge the technology. So if there's like a certificate of something that you can like have verifiable um, this or verifiability to, um, some sort of hash or some sort of signature that's compatible with most blockchains like uh, BLS, uh, then uh, that means that you have the ability to say like, oh, you have some backing US dollar. You don't need a stable coin because you have the US dollar and it's represented as a digital currency. So it's interesting. Uh, there are some countries that are making a push for cashless society. Do you uh, expect cryptocurrency to have a bigger impact on the societies in the near future? Uh, there are countries making a push for cashless society. Uh, I, I think it will have a bigger impact. So a friend of mine is working on this uh, exchange called AfriX. Uh, and so um, originally it was just to 
provide the exchange capabilities to buy Bitcoin in Nigeria. And then they kind of realize that there's a more fundamental problem, which is just getting regular plain old dollars in and out of the country. And so uh, a lot of those uh, countries already rely very highly on mobile phone services. And they have payment systems that tie directly into mobile phone and have some sense of digital identity. And so like not just digital identity, but strong digital identity that's been going for a while. So I think they oddly are more poised to uh, have tighter integrations with uh, digital currency because they have already been like sort of forced into using uh, digital identity systems, um, which are centralized, but for better or for worse, they have them, um, which is not really the case for uh, the US or uh, other uh, countries. One quick add on, I know we're at time, to the last question about the adoption of a digital currency that we have to decide kind of as, as a society or as different societies, right, from country to country, is that when everything becomes digital, you can also track everything that you're doing, which could also include if you eat fast food or if you buy beer, you know, all of these things. I mean, thinking further out 20 years from now, however long, that um, could that be tied to your insurance premium? Could that be tied to how you're being um, charged for, I don't know, some health expense. So it's something to keep in mind that um, when everything can be tracked, it can, it can also have maybe some negative um, consequences. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you, Liz and Zane. We have Cheryl back here to say a couple of words to end the session for us. Hey, could I ask a real quick question? Because I was trying to figure out how to ask a question, but apparently because I'm one of the hosts, I can't put a question in? Oh no. <laughs> Just along the lines of that last question, and by the way, I think all the questions have been great, and thank you so much for answering them all. Um, just in the, the kind of 18 month um, thing that we're in right now, I've seen a lot of our local businesses turn away from um, cash towards mobile payment. And then we also have uh, a good population of unbanked folks down here in San Jose. Um, I'm sure you do up in San Francisco too. And so I'm wondering, you, are you anticipating maybe uh, an, a more of a penetration of um, cryptocurrency right now, at least as we're in this weird world? Maybe by people that wouldn't normally be the cryptocurrency customers, but they're averse to banking or um, just not able to? We have one startup we're working with called Saldo, and they work specifically with um, migrant workers who they'll send money home in Mexico to pay for utility bills. So they're actually paying the utility provider instead of putting money in pocket and bypassing those transunion fees of sending and receiving on both sides. And so we are seeing um, crypto being used for, for unbanked, mm -hmm. with unbanked um, people. And same thing with microinsurance. There's a team we're talking to called EtherRisk um, that's providing microloans for uh, farmers in very remote places um, and also having a, a stable coin aspect to it. So I don't know about locally, like the Bay Area, Zane? No, you're on mute. <laughs> muted, 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 muted. Uh, like, I think um, it's an interesting thing. It almost, for me, I almost feel like uh, people are probably more risk averse. And because the edges of getting money in and out of cryptocurrency are like so fuzzy for a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, that I think uh, people outside of the, the speculative uh, investor crowd are like less inclined to to jump in right at the moment but like if you're into DeFi, now is kind of a hot time because there's so much volatility in the market that it seems like a a, a worthwhile spend expenditure of time to just jump in yeah, yeah. square and once square goes live with the with crypto payments i think that's going to be huge yeah, yeah, I would think so as well. And I think if you're trying to have these um, these uh, uh, companies in your incubator that are working to enable the payments to people, to their families abroad, which I think is a wonderful thing because the, um, the percentage hits to all the money, it, it just seems economically so wrong, but that's my own personal take. But there may be, there might be more diffusion out because once people do that, then they'll have a, a familiarity 
um, with using it and if it can go towards square. Um, anyway, I'm just really interested to see how that'll go, but I wanna be respectful of your time. So thanks for taking my last question. And I wanna thank everybody. We had um, anywhere from 90 to 115, I think, participants besides our attendees at any one time, which is great. Uh, and we really look forward to doing um, more SVLX, um, SVLS uh, talks uh, this fall. And if circumstances mean we're gonna do them this way, which is highly likely, uh, and we'll probably also, even if we can have some people in um, the normal room, they would be spread out. So we would make the virtual participation also optional for an option for everybody in fall. So I wanna just let all the students um, know that please look for these and we will be continuing them in the fall and we hope to see you all come back. And thanks again for your participation. Uh, Cheryl, very quick announcement. Um, yeah. Students, you heard Zane mention Mouse Belts. That is another organization that we've been connecting with through Liz's support. Um, they are hosting a virtual conference um, on blockchain and education May 4th through 6th. We're going to be announcing that through a number of streams on campus. Um, but again, the name of the organization is Block, uh, Mouse Belts and it is May 4th through 6th. If you miss any of the announcements, you can just sign up yourself. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah, you. one last announcement for students. If you're in our Go program, the Go program continues, and I think you can um, just uh, demonstrate, document your participation uh, in this uh, um, Zoom webinar and uh, put that in the system to get some Zoom to some uh, Go points. So thanks. All right, I think with that we're all done. Thank you, Sala and Cheryl, for the opportunity. Yeah, you're welcome. So if you can Thank just stay on for a little bit, that'd be great. Thank you.